There you go. Good morning, colleagues, and welcome to our next DIN webinar. I'm delighted today to be joined by McCappen, Assistant Director of Transformation, uh, down there at uh, the lovely Westwood Housing. Morning, Mick. Morning. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, the, this session has been particularly popular. Um, I think as, as sessions around data always are, and um, I think what we wanted to try and do today was, as we were talking before, we kicked off, uh, there's a lot of talk about data, but I think what we're really interested from a DIN perspective is some action on this. And this is probably the best case study example I've come across in terms of uh, one of our members actually doing something about data and looking at its veracity, authenticity, and actually doing something about it. And uh, I love it. I do love the title, Turning Off the Dirty Tap of Data. And uh, Mick's got some tales to tell about this and how dirty was his, how gungy was his data down at Westwood. But it's lovely and clean now, colleague. And hopefully at the end of this session, you'll have an idea as well how to clean up your dirty data. So, uh, Mick, the floor is yours, sir. I think you should be okay just to uh, go straight into your slide share. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was absolutely clean. I think every time we have a big storm, of course, we open up the drains and sometimes a little bit of nastiness creeps in. Much like uh, much like our water companies do. Well, that's what I'm saying anyway. So no guarantee that it's 100 percent ever really. So, yeah, I'm Mick Capen, Assistant Director of Transformation at Westwood. Been at Westwood since around 2021. So right in the middle of the pandemic, really. I was there before uh, as a consultant working for the the wonderful three C's. So I've got Colin on the call. So a bit of promotion there for him as I as I do that. So, yeah, I was kind of parachuted in there to kind of project managed their data ended up managing the transformation program as well so I don't know I must have been doing something right at the time I suppose so uh, anyway so yeah turning off the dirty data tab that that phrase actually got phrased by the the director of housing at Westwood when I first started doing this and she was explaining to a team about uh, what we were trying to do and she said look what we need to do is actually turn off turn off the data tab stop stuff going in that's that's wrong because every time we cleanse it it kind of adds to it and I think over time it's kind of it got it, I, th I think uh you know the, the dirty bit was added <laughs> a bit of dirt was added to that uh saying really so that's how it kind of came about so um yeah so the the, the kind of westward story sort of started back in 2017 when at the end of that year which was when I was uh when I was sent off uh, by 3C to, to kind of on the back of that. And they'd already done some work around starting to look at their data. And the main reason being is that the CEO, Barbara Shaw there at Westwood, um, was was kind of frustrated, probably a story a lot of you hear, but maybe still do, I, I don't know. But it was like, well, how many, you know, the, the classic of how many properties do we actually manage? Um, and you get about three different answers, depending on whether it was the uh, SDR, version you wanted, whether you included um, your shared ownership and uh, leaseholders and garages, was, was that included or not? And, and so it was really difficult for her to actually just get one version of the truth. And I think that one version of the truth should apply across all your data. And something that I've come across before, I've been in meetings where um, in previous places where I've worked where you might have a director of a, a department executive director saying looking at figures and actually saying I don't I don't recognize those figures um, I, I've got some figures around voids I've got some figures around my performance which is different to the ones that you're showing because we don't include this we include this uh, and so on and it's, it's quite political it can get quite political at that level where people are actually you know using that as a kind of defense for saying well that's not right because actually I need my department my section to actually look better than maybe it does but actually one version of the truth as long as that's agreed is what you need to work upon whether the underlying data of that is is completely accurate is probably is probably at that probably point is irrelevant you need to make it as accurate as possible so there was a lot of discussion around that kind of one version of the truth and the other key thing at that point is we all remember kind of uh pre-pandemic uh was was 
marching towards um, GDPR, which for a lot of us meant, you know, trying to get our data right, trying to comply with that legislation. Um, and the other part for Westwood was around, there was, again, going back to 2017, was a big push for, you know, the, the, the old digital transformation, the channel shift and so on. And, and again, um, the CEO, Barbara Shaw, was, well, I'm not going to start a transformation program until I'm confident that the data we're using and what data we're, we're going to be exposing to our customers is as accurate as it can possibly be. So those were the kind of key drivers for us, really. Um, but it's like with all of this, it's like, well, where do you start? Um, and I think for most of us, um, is when you look at your enterprise framework so you know your your system infrastructure it kind of looks like this and it may still look like this you may have changed it you may have consolidated that which we'll come on to but we've all got you know a, a housing management system of some description whether that's through the traditional routes or, or the, the emerging technologies around things like dynamics but there's a lot of it and it can be very disparate. It's not always joined up. And what we try to do is actually join it up. But then what gets lost is which is the parent system, which data is it? And, you know, trying to um, trying to balance your data between your housing management system and, and possibly your asset management system if it sits outside of your of your core housing management system and i've come across this on other sites is quite difficult you can actually have a discrepancies with even the number of properties or types of properties that you've got which kind of alarm bells are ringing at that stage if, if that's where you are but it's really difficult to gauge that and know that once you've got dirty data in your system the likelihood is you're passing on that dirty data in effect infecting your other systems with data that's actually wrong so what we try to do and, and our um, uh, provider and some of, I'm going to look at the faces for people looking up at, look at their eyes, maybe shooting up into the top of their head was our, our housing management provider is Capita. Um, and for us, the good thing around Capita, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on, on that. We, we actually get on really well with Capita, but the key bit around them is actually we have one core property and person database. So the modular system that we have was actually about putting our eggs in one basket, uh, potentially. Um, and at that time, going back to 2017, 18, when I was when I was deployed into to Westwood, the first decision we had around looking at the enterprise framework was, well, are we going to stick with our existing housing management provider? And I'm sure a lot of you have either had that discussion change that system or either even maybe even looking at doing that now still about where do we go um, and you know a lot of housing providers again going back to that time and when I was working with 3C was dynamics was was fresh to the market and uh, or new a lot of people were looking at as being potentially the silver bullet in terms of moving away from the more traditional route and putting everything into um a system where it was consolidated, where that's where all your data was and your core services around your base housing management system, CRM, your customer portal, even mobile was all coming from that one provider. Um, I, I know someone call, uh, coined the phrase of, you know, one one neck to choke, which I think is a horrible saying, but in a way it's kind of right in terms of if you are doing that, well, at least if there's issues, you've got one supplier to go to and not being in a position where different people or your suppliers, your uh, providers are blaming one another for issues around, around your system. But the, the key output of that was really what we needed was that core database for our property uh, people. Um, so from our perspective and when you look at it and when you start looking at data and you, and you kind of take it to its kind of most simplistic area and you're looking at what for us was developing a data quality and government governance strategy or framework as, as we call it was just around data and what we called the kind of four pillars of data which is your structured data which sits in your business systems your unstructured data, uh, which predominantly exists if you still have network drives, if you've not put everything in SharePoint. SharePoint's a kind of 
structured, unstructured area, really. It's a lot more structured than network drives, definitely. But we still kind of refer to that as the kind of unstructured area of data. And then the two key bits about delivery is around your governance, around data, and your culture. So, and we have many cultures, you know, people say, what's your digital culture? What's your business culture? What, what's your data culture even? But it's absolutely key that uh, with everything that you kind of drive the messages corporately down across the business about how important data is. And I've done many a presentation with, with Colin on how important data is and the saying about, you know, data is the new oil and all of that stuff, which we used to kind of uh, say back then. I, we probably still do, actually, because it's so important for us as a business that our data is as accurate and is it really important in terms of managing uh, your performance and, and making key decisions. So that culture around that was something that we really felt needed to be there. So that's how that came about. And you have to tackle each one of each one of those. So if we just look at the, the kind of structured data that predominantly sits around your core property, person and tenancy information. And at Westwood, you know, that data goes back something like 17, 18 years worth of, of stuff that's been collected. And actually, even now, years after GDPR, we've still not got our retention policies right within our housing management system. So as much as we've cleansed, we're still not getting rid of the stuff or, or uh, even if I could say it with my teeth in, anonymizing yeah, that data to make sure that it's how it should be. So we've still not even cracked that bit. So there's even for, you know, the, we're not we're not the kind of perfect uh, uh, housing association when it comes to data. We still have a lot of work to do. But those were the three key areas that we we focused on um, and we had to find out where our data was. So at Westwood, pretty easy it was going to be in the capita uh, open housing management system that had a various modules but one of the key ones was the asset management module so at least we had that link up we didn't have a, a keystone or a pims there sat outside of that where we were trying to um, update or lead from one system to another but I think generally you need to know where your date is and that old thing around which is the parent system, and which is the child and which is driving the data and which one do you need to get right without the other one then corrupting that data or being updated once it's been pushed on and not being pushed back to that core housing management system or, or core um, data set. So I think for us, the key bit was when we start looking at this, and it's really easy to do, is it can be quite overwhelming in terms of when you start looking at data. So you start looking at your property, sorry, your person data particularly, and you start going, well, you know, this doesn't look right. You know, how do we know contact information is right? How do we know that date of birth is right? How do we know that our NI numbers are right, that we've collected and all of that stuff? So there is data that you know is wrong because it's obvious you may have a date of birth that's either in the future which we have had or you know someone who was born in in 80, 1827 is unlikely to be someone who's actually on your database so there is stuff that you can easily identify that is wrong then you have data that is wrong but you have no way of knowing whether it's right or wrong because a date of birth could be wrong but if it's if it's 1973 then to you that would look right but actually the customer could say actually that's not it's 1978 it's been put in wrong and that can lead to two particular issues but for us it was about saying actually not all data is the same is it really because there is a real big difference between data that is is not accurate so initials could be wrong so you could have jc instead of jk but actually the impact of that being wrong isn't as bad um, as maybe a property not being on your gas service contract. So anything to do with compliance, legality, uh, has much more of an impact on your business than some of the other stuff. So what we did at Westwood was we actually started looking at those key areas and running workshops. So we went from starting a tenancy, starting creating a person, started creating a property, uh, not through its whole life cycle, but just doing the creation and end because that's the kind of two bits. Now, things can happen in between. 
a, a, a tendency can change, a person can change on a tendency, those things can happen. But actually getting it right from the start and getting it right at the end are, are really key. And actually, when uh, when within the capital system you end a tendency in person, if that isn't done properly, you can have stir people that are on a tendency that are deceased, uh, not ended properly, which can all sorts can lead to all sorts of issues. So. What we did is we went through that process and we gauged it against the risk matrix. So anything up towards the right hand side at the top would have a legality issue, um, would cause customer services issues right down to kind of consistency. It's not right. It's not consistent. It's not in the way that we would want the data put in, you know, that those initials haven't got a dot between it, but at the end of the day, does that really matter? It's a consistency issue, but not in terms of its impact on the business. So we scaled all our data in doing that. And actually, when you do it, what you find is you get repeats. So something can be in the lower quartile, something can be in the upper. But as it says there, really, if they're in the upper, it always trumps anything. So you always treat it as being a high risk area of data. That took a lot of work in mapping that, um, but it was absolutely key for us. Um, and when we started doing this back in 2017, we didn't have any tools. We basically, like you did in those days, you'd pull out exception reports into spreadsheets, you use your filters, you try and identify the data that's wrong. You then spent an order amount of time and we had uh, data days where we would go through and we'd correct tenancy data to make sure it was right. So identifying things like introductory tenancies that were like up to uh, seven or eight years old. So uh, an 18 month introductory tenancy was still an introductory tenancy eight years later. Um, but I think the game changer for us in trying to manage it that way in a very kind of passive way, which was we'll produce exception reports. We need someone in the business to go through those exception reports and put the data right. We've created a data dictionary within a spreadsheet, which was good in terms of creating the rules, but we expect everyone to abide by those rules and put in your data properly. In, in, in a true sense, you know, when you actually do that in a practical terms, there's always things that get in the way. And generally that's the BAU. So the business as usual will get in the way. We would send out exception reports and then we would, we would um, audit those exception reports six months and people would say, oh, I'm really sorry. I just had a chance to go through it. Um, I'd never get a chance to do it or I did it then or I've not looked at it since then. And even having a really good data dictionary, no one looks at the data dictionary as much as you can apply the rules and say, when you create a person, you must do it in this way. When you put a property on, you must do it in this way. People for various reasons don't and um, the housing management systems aren't always great at validating that data at source. So sometimes they will, they can validate an email in terms of, well, it's got an at sign and it's got a dot something, so it's valid where it doesn't really validate it in terms of checking it. So we, uh, the sort of game changer for us was the um, implementation of, of data logic uh, info boss, as it was back then, still is provided by, by those, but we purchased this through uh, 3C. And what data logic does, it, it, can't, it works as a, as a data warehouse, really. But what we can do is we can pull in all the structured data and we can create rules around that data that we couldn't put in the housing management system. So we can have that much stronger validation rules against our structured data. Um, and actually, as that's been developed, we can actually apply our rules that we had in the data dictionary. So uh, for instance, you know, if it's a double barrel name, it must have a hyphen, which again is a consistency rule, but you can put it in and you can identify those that haven't got that up to uh, the more um, complex data issues where the risks are higher. Uh, and within that data dictionary, we can actually apply those risks. So within the data dictionary, within data logic, we can say this data is a five and therefore, when we create an alert, you have to respond to this within 24 hours or 48 hours, depending on what it is. And, and if you don't, 
uh, and we know you've not updated it because we'll measure it again is we're far off something to your manager to say this hasn't been done in fact we can create dashboards now around our data performance but the thing around data logic is you can put your structured data in you can also look at your unstructured data which I'll, I'll come on to in a minute and the data dictionary and the data risk matrix have all now been applied so when it comes to turning off that data tap we've now got the tools to enable us to to do that so when you try and turn off the tap what does that actually mean well historically as i said it kind of works like this so you've got a pile of, of data that needs cleansing because you've run your exception reports you've identified that this is wrong or people have actually identified that it's wrong because they've actually contacted someone or you've gathered the information from stockholm or whatever it may be and you take off that stuff uh, and you actually say, well, what's our middle to high risk data? That's what we need to focus on, first of all. So you, you take that and you start working through it and you cleanse it. And then what happens when you're doing that is that people are adding bad data again. And as much as you create the rules, that's what happens, unfortunately. That is about culture. It is about saying to people, you know, uh, as we do, and I'll come on to it and cover it again, but, you know, data is everybody's responsibility. It's not the responsibility of your IT team to make sure your data is cleansed. They can help cleanse it. They can help identify it. But actually, it's the business that needs to ensure that that data is accurate. So how do you stop that? Well, as I kind of alluded to, really, you can create these alerts. So the alerts will go, this data was entered yesterday, it's wrong, and we send an alert to a team, a dedicated person that we've identified or, or mailbox where these alerts will be sent off to, and we expect those people to cleanse that data. So once you've cleansed that, once you've turned off that tap or at least uh, reduced it to a drip, uh, you can then start reducing your pile of key data so starting with your high risk to medium risk you can start going through that now your low risk stuff you may even make the decision never to cleanse it we couldn't cleanse all the initials that are wrong within our system however if we make sure that people put them in right from now on then over time as tenancies end and people change and people contact us and hopefully people will see that it's wrong they can start to put that data right so over time it gets better um but you would neither got the resource all the time to really go through and cleanse everything. So when we talk about Westwood's data being 100% accurate, we know there are areas which it won't be, but it's what we would determine to be lower risk, that its impact isn't as big as some of the key stuff that we really, really need to focus on and make sure is accurate. So when it comes to culture and governance, like I said, at Westwood, um, Thankfully, uh, we have a strong CEO who made this a priority within the business, really. So that message about data being our key asset, that message, which is part of our uh, Evolve, which is our digital transformation program, key principle is data is everyone's responsibility. And if you see it, just like on uh, just like on the railways, if you see it, you need to sort it. So again, the message is to to staff: if you see something is wrong, and I've run workshops in the past where people go, "Oh, I know some really there's a property right you would not believe that it's a three bed house, uh, but on our system it says two, and you're like, what have you done about it? Well, it's not my responsibility; it's property. They need to sort it well actually if you see it then sort it so you may not have the permission to do it within the system but what we've done on our internet is create an area where you can log a data issue and you can say it's to do with this property it's to do with this person and that will email um that will email the property team or will email the lettings team to go in and actually amend that data if they haven't got it if they have got permission to do it then they should actually do it and the key bit around our performance data, which has been another kind of revolution, really, has been, has been our BI transformation. So our Power BI transformation means now that we can really use our data to really drive our performance. And that performance is led by its one version of the truth. So if you're going to go, well, I don't think those figures are right because I know that data is wrong, then you have to get the data right. 
So if you know it, get it right, and then your performance will be right. So it's kind of like it's it's kind of risk and reward really for the business. If we're going to use our data and say these are our KPIs, and people are saying, well, I don't think that's right because our void figures are this then you need to make sure that your staff are updating that void information to ensure that it's right. And that's how it is. And sometimes you have to say, that's what we're using. So you have to up your performance in terms of making sure that people are updating the uh, data correctly, really. And that then links in with decision by data. So again, another kind of mantra is that we make decisions by data. It's not about gut feel. It's not about how much I get paid. It's about saying the data is telling us this, the reaction to that is based on the data that we are seeing and using. And this is all about data quality and governance through iterations. This isn't something your CEO can say, right, uh, we need to cleanse our data. I want it all done by next April. Thanks very much. It, it just doesn't happen like that. You have to pick off what's important, cleanse that, move on to the next thing. And we are still doing that. Um, you know, years later from when we started, it was still going through the process of, of cleansing, really. And, and as I said before, not all data is the same value. There's some data you can say it's not that important to us. Let's not focus on that. Let's focus on on the stuff that is really. Um, and, you know, something that we've kind of tried to instill in people is that person data is only borrowed. So we have it for a period of time. So it needs to be kept right and accurate uh, because when that ends, we need to delete, get rid of, uh, anonymize that data um, off of our system. So we've only got it for that period of time. Property data is different, but for person data, that is definitely the case. Um, so we achieve this through staff briefings. So we do staff briefings and data. I did one recently to reinforce the um, data is everyone's responsibility message because we were still finding we had issues with some of our property data. Um, and it's an executive team agenda item. It, it, it comes up when they're looking at performance. They're also looking at the data and the underlying that. And a corporate objective is around our data as well. So that links in with us providing better services to our customers. So it, it feeds into everything, really. And we've also done a lot of training. We've done a lot of training in terms of data entry, but also around the, the kind of impacts of, of data and poor data and what it can mean for both our customers in terms of when we get SAR requests down to wrong information, um, so it's really key that that's actually part of that process as well. And actually building it into your job descriptions and competence levels is no good saying, you know, you must be competent in IT is actually about a real feeling that people take what they do seriously. And when they're updating data, they're not going, oh, well, I'll just put the date of birth is 1900 for now and then I'll come back and mend it later. There's a there's a need to make sure that people understand that within the job description and competencies about making sure that data is managed uh, appropriately. And, you know, you might have your uh, PIPA um, qualification for typing, but if you type in the wrong stuff, what does that matter? You know, you can type as fast as you like. So the competence level is about knowing why you're doing it and actually understanding the processes we got within the business. And we started doing something called CIAs, which is collaboration, innovation and automation workshops. And what we find sometimes is people go, well, I don't know, I get an email and I just update it because that's what I get told to do. They don't understand the process that they're involved in and the impacts of what they're actually doing. And if they don't understand that, how can you expect people to get it right? They won't, they won't know what that is. Um, so it, again, it's about building in that mentality about if that's the case, why are they inputting the data in the first place? Maybe we need to move it to someone who understands it, has the time to do it uh, and can deliver the quality that we need really. Um, and data maturity. So, so Westwood has recently gone through a data maturity assessment, and that's a really good thing to do because it really enables you to understand where you are on that, on that matrix, that spectrum of data maturity from discovery right through to mastering your data, really. And part of our journey has been to develop a business intelligence team. Again, they're not there 
they're not there to police the data they're not there to kind of go in and, and put everything right but they're there to kind of identify uh, where we might have discrepancies so we can build the alerts we can build the exception reports and we can actually build dashboards that look at uh, data performance as well um, so just quickly on to unstructured data um, so some interesting um, stats there from Alchul Rodell, who used to work for Housemark. I don't think he does now, but so I did a presentation with him and he put those stats up. I think those stats are about two or three years old now, but really interesting in terms of the impact that unstructured data can have on your business. And in particular, um, the impacts of, of what we call the kind of hidden factory of data. And, and when Arturo Ray said this, it really resonated with me because I think with any business, and I've been to a few uh, when I was a consultant, where there's loads of data that gets kept in spreadsheets. And people, we all love spreadsheets. We wouldn't be in IT. I wouldn't have thought really unless we started with spreadsheets. But spreadsheets can be quite risky. Um, and actually what you find is that um, people create spreadsheets outside of your core business systems for various reasons that they do that. They'll either do it because they don't think the business system delivers it and they've not asked, but they think this is a better way of doing it. Um, they do it because they want to produce their own performance information. So on the back of it, they want to be in control. Um, I think the other reason is, is because people love a good spreadsheet they love the, the kind of creativity of it they love the fact that they they're in control of it and and you get this kind of holistic view of your data set the downside to it is the amount of time that gets spent in doing that um and it's it's a hidden factory where it's like lost time in producing it which is why we created the bi team really to really start pulling that to, together in fact it's kind of cal calculated about 60 percent of lost time is through the management of spreadsheets because people spend so much time on them in doing them whether that's in finance in your lettings team in in property particularly uh where they create all these spreadsheets which are mammoth they not only that they take up so much space on your um on your on your drive because people will just create another copy each week of these of these spreadsheets that are massive the other risk to it is that when they when they leave because actually it was never part of their job to create this stuff uh, it falls to it to try and unpick what it is and and what the formulas are and how to keep it going so you actually create a risk within within the business really so our thought on you know the, the way we've taken that to forward is actually how we can reduce that we, you know uh, I've got a reputation at Westwood now as being you know Mr Spreadsheet hater and I'm not because I've got some of my own um, and I don't hate spreadsheet I love spreadsheets but but I'm every time someone says oh we create a spreadsheet they always apologize to me which is quite weird really um, but the key bit is is that we've we've just well, we're, we're currently rolling out a, a spreadsheet audit so we've asked people to collate guess what ironically in a spreadsheet but what they use spreadsheets for is it about a business process? Is it about monitoring? Is it about, you know, um, just listing things out, you know, just a good way? I mean, the whole of the PMO is in a spreadsheet. So our project portfolio exists within a spreadsheet. But if people are using it to allocate lettings, to manage voids, then it's like, why isn't your core business system doing that? Maybe a good reason for changing your core housing management system if that's the case it may be that people don't understand the functionality and the response I've had quite a lot is yeah but I can't see everything and I've got to log in and I can only look at one property at a time which is where your power bi comes into it really because you can create those views of your data so and we've done that with gas servicing uh, where they were using spreadsheets to manage the gas service and obviously that particular area uh, is is really key because of its consequences as we spoke about and we've managed to move them off of spreadsheets to using a power bi where they update the housing management system but the results of that are captured in power bi where they're actually it can highlight particular issues so where we've not gained access we can get alerts and everything off of that so there are ways now to take that forward. We can just remove some of that and it's all automated. And we've probably saved weeks of time in terms of people updating that and not allowing people in. That was the other thing. Housing management couldn't see the spreadsheet because property wouldn't let them in it. So they didn't want them corrupting it. Uh, now everyone's using the Power BI. So it's really important to do that. And obviously, if you are replacing systems, then make sure that functionality of what you want 
from a reporting perspective is there and obviously the links to power bi uh, which again has been a game changer for us is massive so the other bit about unstructured data is how much sits on your network drives if you've moved everything to sharepoint you still may need to to do this but again we've started this recently we looked at the number of emails that were saved on our on our just just in a folder on our network drive we had um literally tens of thousands of emails saved over the years people saving emails uh why i have no idea but they do so when you look at it you've got all these different file types and what data logic can do it can look at those file types it can look at the core data around the creation date it can actually look inside so even on a pdf it can search for keywords so you can tag data in terms of reference numbers if it's got an address if it's got salutations at the end of it particular words like arrears or um repairs so it can look for this stuff you can identify stuff that actually shouldn't be sat on your network drive should be in your document management system from a uh, a size perspective, perspective itself that's really important that you do that but you can also look at the modified dates so we're now using data logic to really interrogate our unstructured data it does feel like a massive mountain to climb i have to say the amount in there in our preparation for really getting our data cleansed before we put it into sharepoint we don't want to i always say it's like moving house you know you move house you go up the tip you get rid of it you only take the stuff that you want you don't take everything with you, dump it in your house and then sort it out after. So that's kind of where we are really uh, with it. And, and this example is when we looked at those um, email messages, uh, this is how many we've got over going back to 2013. We've still got 969 emails that are created and saved going back there. Um, but what we did in, 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 in Power BI was to actually look at how many times they then get accessed. So if you look at 2019, in 2020, all those emails were only accessed 11 times and then four times. We had a bit of a spike in 2022, I don't know why. It went up to 43 and then, and then this year once. It's like, why are people keeping this stuff? What is it? We don't even know what it is half of it. So again, Power BI, the strength for that is that we've had a campaign. We had a, a blitz it day last week. We got rid of 18,000 uh, emails uh, that we're working through to the point where we will just literally delete some of this older stuff, any, anything past kind of two years, we have to make the decision just to get rid of it because uh, we're kind of hoarding it really. Um, so just in summary, sort of top down, you need top down ownership, you need your management team, your directors to own it, they need to be responsible for it within their own departments. So, you know, director of property needs to say, if we find issues, we, we need to look at that ourselves really. Obviously, yeah, review your enterprise framework. It's probably people doing that anyway. It's an ongoing thing that you do, but whether you're consolidating down, but if you have got disparate systems, you kind of have to weigh up their value versus the management of it, I suppose, really. Um, and we started with that core property person tenancy data. Um, implement the right tools. I'm not here to promote uh, data logic. There's Interzeta, there's other uh flavors of these systems on the marketplace so so look at them they're, they're really good you do get a kind of data warehouse out of it uh i think anyway um and you can enforce that then through your kind of alerts so there's kind of no escape now because you're getting alerts you have to act on them um and actually we can then look at our performance data uh so we can literally play one department off against the other about how clean or, or their data is um and you have to do it for alliterations there's no good the ceo saying i want it all cleaned by christmas it isn't going to happen you have to you have to bite at it like a biscuit really um and you know i i would as i said at the beginning it, it, it said you know you know our our data is never going to run pure clean it, it won't because there's always going to be things in it there's always going to be things that we haven't checked that we won't know until we actually speak to that person or visit that property to really find out whether that data is accurate or not so that was it really um so i don't know if there's any questions i'll, I'll stop sharing there we go thank you very much mick um there you go colleagues probably the best presentation on uh data that you're going to see this year i i, I think um so many questions sort of coming through um which we'll get members to ask them. a couple of questions from me and again it's just 
trying to keep them relevant and looking ahead around this. Uh, one's an internal one. Did you do any exercise to understand the business cost versus the business risk of going into this particular exercise? Um, I don't think we looked at it from a pure business cost perspective. I think it's much more around the uh, risk factors to the business itself uh, in not having data that's accurate, uh, as accurate as it can be. And definitely about us being seen um, as, as doing the right thing in terms of, uh, of moving forward, really. So I think in terms of, of us being monitored and you know when, when we have our assessments and stuff uh, to ensure that we can actually with some confidence say this is what we've done this is where we're going um, so I think in terms of cost benefits there definitely are cost benefits I suppose in terms of us from a performance perspective and we know from the implementations we've done around Power BI uh, we've saved time so that example around the spreadsheet uh, for gas servicing we've probably saved about you know uh, a couple of days a month in terms of getting that and updating that where it's automated so i think from a business case perspective you can start drilling down on it i think overall it's kind of the cost of not doing it far outweighs any investment you have to make in terms of of delivering it really okay thank you and one of the, another sort of really topical issues around sort of artificial intelligence and how organizations are going to look at this and i think one of the issues you've clearly flagged up there is you know, probably our AI is not for you if you've not actually already cleansed your data uh, around that. But I just wondered whether, if because obviously it can be quite a task having somebody sit down and manually sort of go through all of the flags and things like that. Is this something that you're looking at in the future that you could use sort of artificial intelligence to rapidly validate the data uh, in a way that, you know, might be difficult for humans? I think it's possible. I mean, I think in terms of... I mean, I think where we're, you know, again, with AI, it's kind of developed, obviously, from the, the DIN conference up at Microsoft, you know, it, it's developing at such a rate. And I think I think the way we look at AI is ensuring that when I, AI is looking at data, because obviously it's going to make assumptions around using its algorithms to do that, that, that our data when it's looking at the underlying data is as accurate as possible. I suppose in terms of cleansing, I don't think we've really kind of considered it at the moment. I think having the alerts and identifying where it doesn't meet our rules is really key, but then it knowing what to put in, I think would be quite difficult at the moment. Okay, no, no that, that's brilliant. A lot of questions to get through. Uh, Mick, so let's see if we can get through as many before 11 as possible. Uh, Dave Loudon, you asked the first question. Do you want to just switch your mic on and ask uh, Mick? Yeah, um, one of the things that obviously uh, we need to focus on is the customer experience. And um, I can't remember the question now. It was about your, your, early, your early thing you said about um, the drivers were basically, um, you know, digital transformation, etc. But I would wonder if you ever considered that the end result to the customer on looking at your data and getting your data right and, and doing all the work you've done, can you measure somehow the impact that what you're doing through the likes of, of data logic, et cetera, um, the impact to the customer? Is there any way you can do that? Um, well, I suppose if you, if you link the BI stuff around Power BI and looking at your data performance so how much of your data is deemed to be accurate against the criteria then yeah. obviously any data around your personal data uh, or customer data I suppose you're holding um, would be would be a key impact because obviously you know an example would be and it wasn't at Westwood but I know an example of someone phoning up uh, on behalf of their mother uh, wanting a repair done and saying that they obviously did a validation check but the the date of birth for the mother was wrong yeah. so you've now got a customer services yeah. advisor who's then going well can't actually order the repair you've got someone who just wants to order repair for their mother and in fact what they said was this happened last time i phoned up which is really frustrating for the customer yeah. because now it's like well you said this before i gave you the right date of birth you still not updated it and now you're telling me you won't do it in the end they ordered it in the end unfortunately uh the call was recorded and then the customer advisor got a little bit of a ticking off for actually ordering the repair in the first place. So, I mean, if you look yeah. at the risk against that in ordering the repair, I would say the risk was quite low because who the hell is going to phone up and, you know, pretend to be someone else to order something for their mother. However, strictly speaking, 
yes, they're right. Um, so I think that ability for allowing either the customer to be able to update or, or um, make sure that their, their data is accurate is important. In fact, you know, we, we've done some, we've had some initial conversations anyway with Verse One who uh, deliver our, our, our web portal yeah. uh, with data logic. So about actually them being able to um, allow people to say, look, you know, it's been a while since you checked this data. Could you could you log in much like you do from your insurance company or whatever? We just want to check this mobile numbers. Right. We want to check your personal details are correct. So we're actually getting our customers to update their information now. There's obviously, again, there's no reason they could input it wrong again, unfortunately. Um, and there's some stuff they can't change. Like they can't just go in and change their last name because they want to be known as such and such from now on. But however, I think empowering the customer to check their data and update certain parts of it is, is a really good way. There's nothing better than the source data. And at the end of the day, if they put it in wrong, then we can't be blamed for that. So I just I, guess my point, uh, Mick, was that the... The, the end driver, the real driver is the customer experience, right? They're, they're all internal drivers, but the, the benefit of doing this, the goal of doing this is to improve the experience and the service to the customer. Anyway, there's loads of questions. I've shut up. Now. Yeah, I was going to say that. Thanks, thanks, Dave. Right, Mick, uh, we've got the next one. Kate Boston, uh, if, if quite a practical one. Do you want to ask uh, yours? Kate, are we... Sorry, it took me ages to come off mute. I wasn't ready. Um, I was. I wanted to ask how how did you select the data logic system that you you are using? Um, did you go through a process, or did you kind of just find one that looked like it suited your needs? Yeah, Mick. Oh. Has my question driven him away? I was going to say yes. <laughs> he's 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 gone away to his spreadsheet to find the answer. I think. Um, <laughs> let me just uh, just see. Hello. Hi, I'm making you back. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I just yeah, dropped. How, out. how did you choose? How did you choose data logic? Um. Okay. So we I'd done some initial work when I was with Three C around it. Um. So when it actually came to deployment again. I, there was other companies that we we looked at um purely at that time cost wise uh it was it was cost effective to go with it it was it was new to the market so i think we were a little bit of a uh, a test site for it really um so and i felt that it was a a company that uh, with infoboss anyway that some of the things that we were pushing for like embedding the data dictionary um <clears throat> And the risk was something that they were keen to deploy. So we felt it was a company that that we could work with uh, in terms of those developments, and and that's proven to be the case. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Randall. Randall Shortly, you've got a couple of questions. I'll let you choose whichever is the most important one to you. Uh, I'm going to go with the first one. I think um, so. I mean, a key way of getting the right data into a system is to kind of apply some conditioning uh, and other rules you know within the system itself right you know you can tell people oh you should put it in this way but if you can actually build that into the system itself so that they can't put the, the date of birth in wrong in, a, in an info, incorrect format or something like that um, then that will work much better I just wondered if you've had any success with your uh, and how you've partnered and worked with your housing management systems provider to make any of those changes have you done any of that stuff has it worked well for you some, I mean, I think Capita have, as I said, they are, they, they they try and implement validation at the source of entry. Um, there's some parts, is, if anyone knows Capita, then it's the progress database that sits behind. So, for instance, one of my one of my key hates is the fact that I think this is changing in uh, one, but it's definitely the case in open, is it says first names in one part of the system and first name in another part, which is really annoying. And it doesn't validate. So you can put two names in uh, with no hyphen. You just put two names in and, and it lets you do it. I, you know, some of the validation is there. Like, so date of birth, it will, uh, you know, obviously it has to be in a particular format. Uh, NI numbers, it validates. In fact, it won't let a duplicate NI number into the system. So if it already exists, it will go, that's already existing in the system. So there are some key 
validations, but some of those other rules that we've stated in terms of the way that you put an address in, for instance, like we always say, you have to put the full um, address. So Avenue is Avenue, don't put Av, don't do any of those things. Again, that's just a consistent PC perspective, but we've created those rules. So if it identifies that and we can do that within data logic, it will go, that dress isn't right. You need to change it because from now on in, this is the way we actually need it. Um, so I think Capita have done some stuff. It will validate things like telephone numbers, like mobile numbers. It knows it begins with a, an 07 or an 0 whatever and the number of characters, but it, it you know, it's not going to go off. Uh, we did, we actually did some work with, company called data eight in in validating in telephone numbers in terms of checking it and and actually that company saying whether that mobile um number was still alive which was which was really interesting but there's a kind of ongoing cost for doing so really so they are getting there but there is still a long way to go in 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 it and the problem is is that we don't like future birth dates, but I know other organizations have gone, oh, well, we want to put a future birth date in because if a child's being born, we put, and you're like, why would you want to do that? But they do. And it's like, well, you know, so it's there. And a lot of it is kind of in the way you actually use it. Um, because unfortunately with us housing associations, we all want different things. So the scope then becomes really wide. Uh, in, in terms of that and even on the parameter fields you know the parameter fields if you don't check those what you end up doing is people just adding to those parameter lists and not um, not archiving off the old stuff so they're still choosing stuff uh, and then once it's in a system you can't get rid of it so if you change your parameters you still got an old parameter that was set because it's 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 as it was at that point, it doesn't delete it. So even with that, you should go in and then choose the most up-to-date parameters. So you can do stuff around that. So that, you know, those are useful, but then then in my experience anyway, they're never as good as they could be. Okay, thanks very much, Randall. Um, Martin Hammond, next, do you want to switch your mic on? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my question is uh, around the, the flip side to um, the, the IT team don't own the data. Um, conversations around the organisation have always been about who does own the data. So I think IT get it by default, um, like especially when it comes down to customer uh, information, customer details, um, which team um, is the custodian really, I suppose, because I mean, your allocations team are gathering the information in the first instance, but then once the tenancy is let, um, it's over to another team and then there might be specialist fields that only some teams use. So I just wondered how um, Mick would have uh, approached that principle. Oh, again, I, I think is that mantra from top down really. I mean, you know, we can, we can gatekeep it in terms of identifying what looks like poor data. But if you've got a surveyor, if you've got a housing officer in front of a customer, and they're looking at information on their mobile device and they see it's wrong it's kind of it's your response it's, it's like you know so i suppose it's the same thing that applies to to anything that we we should be be identifying uh when we're out on site so if you identify something is wrong it's either your responsibility as i said to to change it or to report it you know and um that's like safeguarding and if you see a situation you shouldn't go well you know that's up to someone that's not my area of business i'll leave it out to somebody else or even now compliance um so there is an onus i think for for people to take re responsibility for it um the problem with housing management systems in general is is that ability to we have to apply rules in terms of who's got access to what so that always seems to be the kind of deal breaker in terms of people go, well, I'm not allowed in there, which is why we created the, the report your data on the intranet thing. So that there's no excuse. You can't say, well, I can't ever update it. So I don't know what to do. Um, you can just log it in there and, and, and report it. So I think it, it's kind of, when we created the BI team, there was this thing about, you know, should we say, you know, we're kind of there to kind of police the data. And again, the CEO was really keen to say, don't even say that. If you say it, people assume you're then responsible for it. So what you need to do is provide the information, say this data is wrong. Uh, you need to, you know, need to, you need to, to cleanse it. I mean, obviously when you're working on the backlog, once you've turned off your dirty data tap and you're working on the backlog, then that's just about joint working. That's just, you know, and it may be 
you agree, uh, cost permitting, that you actually get some temporary staff in to cleanse that data because to actually take people out of the BAU to do it would just have a would have an impact. You just want to get it done. And once you got it done and you've turned off the tap, then hopefully it's not going to start to you know devalue over time. So it is very much the mantra that data is everyone's responsibility. And, and I think you just have to keep reinforcing it, really. Yeah. In, in your example, Mick, where you said um, if someone hasn't got access to update that, it just gets sort of reported. Who would that report go to to rectify? <clears throat> so what we did within the business, within each department, is identify uh, teams, uh, a number of people, and set them up with a mailbox. So if it's, uh, you know, if it's person information that's wrong, if it's, you know, the wrong initial, uh, wrong date of birth, then generally it will get sent to someone in the lettings team to put right or in housing support, uh, depending on that. So we do have to do, unfortunately, we still have to do a little bit of manual filtering around that um, because to actually I to try and get data logic to um, send a report, an alert off to an individual, we literally would have to replicate massive amounts of reports with slight differences in it to send it off so within the bi team we have got an assistant who when they get an alert they will check it and just go yeah that needs to go off to support and that'd be dave in support so i'll send it to them so there is a little bit you know behind the scenes i haven't got that ai sorted yet that can go uh, oh yeah that's definitely that person so there is a little bit of manual intervention um however on the property side it literally goes to the asset team the property issue it goes to the asset team yeah it's always a lot easier when it's the asset information yeah 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 okay look i'm just conscious of the time we probably will run a few minutes sort of over but there's a, a couple of really good questions i'd like to sort of get answered um a bit like aladdin and his, his magic lamp we've we've rubbed the uh the data lamp and colin sales from 3c has appeared and colin you've got a question do you want to ask it yeah, yeah, good, thank you. Um, Mick, we all talk a lot about data maturity now, and there are various data maturity models out there. Um, these are to assess whether you really have got yourself a data-driven business. And, and um, um, you mentioned you, you had done review of data maturity. Where did you get to on that? And what framework did you use? So that was done through Data Orchard. Uh, so we use their framework. It's quite a difficult one, really, because data, data maturity is different than data quality. And you think, well, how can it be? Because <laughs> it's like, you know, no one no one comes in and actually starts ripping into our data and going, oh, we found, we'll just leave that to internal audit. They're very good at going, we found five of your properties where the components were wrong. Uh, they're very good at doing that. Um, so we leave that to them, really. But the data maturity is much around the kind of softer side of it, really. It's around your governance. It's around your culture. It's about the message. And when we did it, um, that message around data is everyone's responsibility really has soaked through the organization so if you said that to someone in housing management they would recognize that term as being something that we we would use and obviously having a data governance framework in place having the bi dashboards having data logic means that we're capable of responding to issues having the maturity to actually say right okay you've identified that we can react to that we can put something in place to stop that happening we can turn off that tap there and that some of that sometimes is just process review sometimes that's just about going through the process of saying why does this fall down and it's because poor old you know mandy's just there going i just get the emails and i just update it no one's ever told me what i should be putting in that's what I think I should be putting because I've been told to do it. So you can kind of unpick that. And actually on some of it, we have automated it. You know, we have automated loaders. So creating the loader as opposed to having 10 people who all update the information, we, we you know we can, we can do that now. So I think, yeah, data maturity is good because it gives you a benchmark on where you are. I think within the housing sector, what I'd like to see on data maturity is, um, is accreditation. I think if we had accreditation, uh, much like investors and people and cyber essentials, it at least gives you the benchmark of where you are. So if your uh, exec team were brave enough to go, look, we think our data is rubbish. It's not about doing it at the end. Let's do it at the beginning. Because if we are at, you know, discovery stage, at least we know where we are. 
Um, and then we got you've got something, you've got an action plan then, which you can get to work through to get you to that stage. But those building blocks that the, you know the the um that kind of the the data pillars, if you like, are those key areas you need to kind of get right. Um and data maturity allows you to work around those four pillars. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Colin. Thanks for your question. Uh, and thanks for Mick. We we have reached our time. Lots of people are having to jump off for 11 o'clock calls. Um, just a couple of things to sort of flag up uh, that you might be interested in if you've enjoyed this session. On the 12th of July, we're going to be taking a look at housing management systems and legacy technologies and looking at uh, what some of the new for-profits are actually doing in that particular space. And then uh, a quick day for your diary, uh, 17th of October, um, we have our first annual AI conference in the blink of AI. Um, and hopefully some of you will see there. You never know, we might have Mick come along talking about how he's using AI then. But in the meantime, can we just switch our microphones on and just thank Mick for getting the week off to an absolutely fantastic start. And just let's just give him a, a quick round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mick. Okay, Thanks, guys, sir. have a good week and we'll okay. send, share the recording round shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.